welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Now, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him whatever we ask, because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. Now, let's focus on the first part of that. If our hearts do not condemn us. Everything that happens in your life and the way in which you respond to the events that occur depends upon the nature of your heart. Now, Jesus made that clear. So what we're going to do this morning is see how God wants to operate first in our hearts and then through our lives because of what is happening in our hearts. Now, the Old Testament distinguishes very clearly between the old and the new. Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, says the old has gone and the new has come. Meaning that the old life or the old nature no longer is what controls our life, but now we have a new nature. Now, the heart stands between these two. Whether the heart is set upon the old or the new will determine what a Christian does. So let's just look at the contrast. Here, the scripture says, that what is operating is the law of sin and death. Here is operating the law of the spirit of life. Here there is just the natural life of the flesh. Here there is the supernatural life of the Spirit of God. Here, self reigns. Here, the secret is Christ in you. Now, when you look at that, what you realize is that your new nature is Christ in you. That is your new nature. This is why John, when he's writing in his first epistle, says that those that are born again, those that have this new nature, do not sin. Most uh, translations say do not continue to sin, but actually the Greek really means they do not sin. What John is getting at is this. Christ in you cannot sin. Christ in you is your new nature, 
and Christ in you cannot sin. Impossible. In him there is no sin. So if our hearts are set upon living according to the new nature, we will not sin. If our hearts and our minds are set upon earthly things, upon the self, upon the things of this world, upon the things of the flesh, then we will sin. Sin is literally to miss the mark. It's to miss the mark of what God intends for us to live according to our new nature with the law of the spirit of life, walking in the spirit, revealing Christ in us. So in this new life, this new nature, there is no sin. Which is why the writer to Hebrews says that you have been made perfect forever. Here, Christ is your righteousness, in him there is no sin. Here, Christ is your holiness, in him there is no sin. Here, Christ is your wisdom, so here there is no foolishness. So if your heart was 100% set on living according to the new, you would walk in the perfection of Jesus. His heart was set perfectly, fully, completely on doing the will of God. So here, the will of God is successfully outworked. Here, the will of man, the world, the devil. Take your choice. Right, now let's listen to what Jesus says about the heart. He says, a person speaks because of the overflow of his heart. So if his heart is set perfectly and completely upon the new, everything he says will reflect that. He will be speaking the truth of God's word. He will be speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will never, ever, ever, ever guide us to anything on this side. The Holy Spirit lives within us to urge us, to enable us to live in this way. So, Jesus says, the nature of the heart determines what we say. But it also determines what we do. So, Jesus says, if what comes out of a man from his own heart, sorry, it is what comes out of a man from his own heart that makes him unclean. There's nothing unclean here. There's nothing impure here because this is Christ in you. There's nothing unclean, there's nothing impure in Christ. So, It is what comes out of a man that, that from his own heart that makes him unclean. Such things as evil thoughts. Evil thoughts can't come from this side. 
Evil thoughts must come from this side. So it's still possible for us to have evil thoughts. Remember, heart, mind, you can't distinguish in Hebrew thinking. If your heart is set upon things above, your mind is set upon things above. If your mind is set upon things above, it's because your heart is set upon things above. Are you there? So it's what comes out of a man from his own heart that makes him unclean. Such things as evil thoughts, sexual immorality, there's no sexual immorality here. It all comes from this side. Theft, no theft here, but the one who wants to rob, to steal, to kill, destroy, he's very much operating on this side. Murder, well, he likes to kill, that's this side. Adultery, no adultery here. So adultery comes from there. So if we ever hear of a Christian falling into such sin, he has stopped walking according to the law of the spirit of life. He is now walking according to the law of sin and death. We know he shouldn't do that and doesn't need to do that because he has died to sin through his co-crucifixion with Christ, except that he's not living, died to sin. Now, you see, when people get into sin, they will make all kinds of excuses. I was tempted, I couldn't help it, the devil's having a go at me, I'm in some kind of bondage, and so on and so on and so on. But actually, Jesus says, the truth of the matter is your heart. That a person only remains in bondage if his heart is still set upon pleasing himself rather than on pleasing God. As soon as we want to please God and walk according to the spirit of life, he sets us free from whatever bondage we have that is, if you like, the consequence of or the influence of the spirit of sin and death. Are we, are we getting so far? You might think, oh, well, I've, I've passed, all right, so far, there's no adultery or murder. But we'll read on, because the next thing Jesus says is greed, malice, having a wrong negative attitude towards others, deception, putting on an appearance that isn't real, lust, not just sexual lust, but lusting, uh, lusting after things, lusting after position, lusting after recognition, lusting after leadership, all kinds of lusting that can go on in Christians' lives, envy, slander, speaking against others, pride, wanting to promote yourself, foolishness, the foolishness of hearing God through his word by his spirit, but not putting his word into practice. Then Jesus said, these evil things start in a person's heart. And these are what make him unclean before God. So, God has done everything through the cross of Jesus to make us holy, righteous, pure, perfect, totally acceptable in his sight. He actually took out the old heart and gave you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. So your heart is not in bondage to any of this negative stuff of the old unless you allow that to happen. But actually God has given you a heart for him, for his will, for his ways. So always the real question, the issue in our lives, 
is where our hearts are set. This is why Paul says, set your heart. When you set something, you focus in that direction and you keep in that direction. So set your heart on things above, where Christ, who is to rule and reign in you, is where the Holy Spirit will bring everything from the Father and the Son and make it possible for you to live as in your inheritance as a co-heir with Christ. So everything really depends upon where our hearts are set. Now, I take it that, like me, nobody here is yet living in perfection. I'm quite willing to sit down and let somebody else take over if they're living in perfection. We all, every one of us, have a perfect position in Christ. But our performance does not match perfectly our position. So we can blame all kinds of things, temptation, the devil, other people, and what they've done to us. But actually, the whole matter is really the nature of our heart. If Christians fall into any kind of sin, any of those things are mentioned or anything else, envy, slanders, jealousy, so on, selfish ambition, just remember Jesus said that those with selfish ambition will never enter the kingdom of God. So just be sure you don't have any selfish ambition, any desire to promote yourself. That's... He puts that on a par with adultery and murder and other, other things. So <clears throat> we are going to be saved from that, aren't we? God doesn't want us to have hearts full of selfish ambition. Godly ambition, which is to become more and more like Jesus, that's fine. But not ambition to promote ourselves. <clears throat> You've heard me say again and again and again, the people that God raises up are those who have no desire to be raised up. He raises up the humble. Not those who think they ought to be raised up. So, <clears throat> that again is all to do with the nature of the heart. Now, an orange thing has appeared here, which is amazing. So, Jesus described his heart as humble. Why did God raise him up? Because he was the most humble person that ever walked on the face of the earth. He came as the perfect servant. And he said he had a humble and gentle heart. Now because of that, you see, he did not judge, he did not condemn, said, I haven't come to judge, I've come to save. But out of this humility, there was a perfect submission to the will of God. What happens when we sin? something of the old is actually being expressed through our new lives, which is not God's purpose or intention at all. But it happens because we have allowed something negative into our hearts or our hearts still desire something that is not the will of God, 
but something that will please self. So this is why Jesus said, if anyone is going to follow me, he's got to deny himself. Every day he will have to deny himself. Because we live in a world that lives according to the old, and we're continually surrounded by temptations and by the enemy's activity to want us to look back. This is why Jesus said, those who look back are not fit for the kingdom. You don't look back to the old, you look forward with your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, so that you live in the good of the new. Now, God knows that we will not perfectly express this life. Which is why in that same epistle that we quoted from at the beginning, John says, if we sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you see the, if you like, the speed with which any believer confesses his sin depends upon the humility of his heart. How humble he is before God. And if he's humble before God, he'll also be humble before others. Uh, because it's a dispensation of the heart. You see, what Jesus makes clear is you can't have a heart attitude towards God that is different from the heart attitude you have towards people. A heart attitude is a heart attitude, right? That is what is in your heart. So whatever is in your heart towards God and people will be the same. So this is why, you see, the scripture says, if you love God, you will love your brother also. Why? Because your heart is full of love. So whether you talk about loving God, loving people, you love because that's what is in your heart. But by the same token, you see, John says, if you do not love the brother who you do see, you cannot love God who you do not see. Why? Because there is a lack of love in your heart. And so you can't sort of suddenly switch love for God on when it comes to the prayer time. Hello? God is not fooled by that because he looks upon the heart. He doesn't look upon the outward appearance, he looks upon the heart. So when we're worshipping, I don't think he's listening to the words, he's looking at the heart. Which is why Jesus says that what the Father is looking for is not worship, but worshippers. Worshippers are those who have a heart that desires to glorify and to praise God. They're not going through the motions of reading words off a screen. But they have this heart desire to glorify the Lord. Those are the kinds of worshippers the Father is looking for. So Jesus has this humble, gentle heart. Now that's not being soft-hearted. Jesus does not have a soft attitude towards sin. He forgave the woman caught in adultery, but he said, go and sin no more. People think he was being a bit soft because he was not agreeing that the woman should be stoned to death. But in fact, you see, out of his humble, gentle heart, he was expressing mercy. Now, when Christians take offense and therefore there's problems, division, separation, often people leave churches in offense, it's because of the lack of gentleness in their hearts, lack of mercy. 
instead of forgiving if somebody has offended them, I mean, often they take offense at something that wasn't offensive. But if they take offense, I, I found that often, you see, the thing that causes people to take offense is if you speak a word of correction into their lives. And sometimes when you're in leadership, you have to speak a word of correction. And if people take offense, it's because of the nature of their heart. You've been reading, I trust, Proverbs these last few days, and you will see that there's several Proverbs that talk about how, <clears throat> out of love for God, we welcome correction. But the one with a good heart is thankful for the correction that God brings into their lives. Hallelujah. That's a good, submitted, humble, gentle heart. Now, this same Jesus was the man of authority and power. But what did he teach Paul? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness, in your humility, in your gentleness. Hello? You know, we think we've got to be some great shakes, but in fact, what God desires is that we have those humble, broken, submitted hearts before him. Broken of, that, of those desires to please self, to promote self, I taught some of you last week <clears throat> that Lucifer was the one in heaven who promoted God. He was leading the heavenly host in worship of the Lord, glorifying, honoring, praising God. Then he got the ridiculous idea that he himself should be as God and he should become the object of worship, of praise, of adoration. That he should be on the throne with God, being the object of worship. Now, this is interesting because, you see, it shows that the spiritual creation that God brought into being before the natural creation is still absolutely dependent, is created in love by the one who is love. Which means that even in heaven, uh, all the heavenly host desire to worship God if their hearts, like with Lucifer, turns against God, immediately, Jesus says, they fall from heaven. I saw Satan fall like lightning, like a flash of lightning. Vroom, he was out. Why? Because in heaven, there is only this. In heaven, there can't be anything remotely like that. So as soon as Lucifer's heart became proud, he was out, and one-third of the angels with him. Now, as a result of his fall, what did he do? He turned against the very one who he had been promoting. And you will find that if a person, for example, leaves a church out of offense, you know what they do? That, while they are part of that church, it's been the church, the greatest church, I'm, I love my church, I'm so thankful for what God is doing in me, all oh, the pastors are such a blessing, bom, 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 bom. They take offense, and what do they do? They follow the practice, the example of Satan. That church, don't go near it, they're terrible, they offended me, the pastor is a mess, he's a nuisance, he's bum bum. They follow Satan. And then they dare to say the Holy Spirit 
has led me to do this. Do you think the Holy Spirit would cause anybody to imitate Satan? Hello, anybody in this morning? So that just shows us how easy it is if people allow anything from here to get into their hearts like offense, that then they turn against what previously they were promoting without necessarily realizing that's what they're doing because that's the nature of deception. So you can't love one another by separating from one another, can you? I'm just using that as an example. But you see, whenever, whenever we allow anything of the old into our hearts, then that's going to cause us problems. But those problems are also going to have an impact on the others around us. Is anybody alive this morning? You see, because what, what you can see is if you are walking in this, what is going to flow out of your life is good. It's going to be Christ in you, rivers of living water flowing out, the spirit of, the, uh, uh, of life is going to be manifested in your life. There's, there's going to be the love, the righteousness, the holiness of Jesus, the power of God. And we, you can see that a measure of that is happening already, but the problem is that that perfection becomes compromised because of the desires of our heart that actually are not pleasing to God. Because they are, well, they can be focused on sin, but... I don't think with most Christians they are consciously and deliberately wanting to sin. It's just that their hearts are focused on self and therefore they sin. Often without realizing that what they're doing is sin until they come under the conviction power of the Holy Spirit. But you see... To promote self is not to deny self. Are we getting this? So, you know, we can rail against the devil, we can, we can blame other people for all kinds of negative situations in our lives, and we miss the point. Saying, God, the real problem is my heart. Because I've allowed the negatives into my heart, I don't know how to cope or I'm not coping well with the circumstances in which I'm placed. So it's easy to blame the circumstances when in reality, the real problem is the heart. This is why, you see, Jesus did not speak about issues. He was very few issues that Jesus spoke about. But all the time he was aiming at the heart because he knew if the heart is right, the issues would be right. And when, when the issues, when problems arose, they would get resolved because the heart was set upon pleasing God, was set upon trusting God. The, the believer is walking by faith you get your focus on self and faith goes out by the back door. Why? Because you're actually putting your faith in the one you look at. This is why you see when people look at their feelings, they, they look at their natural gifting and so on, they're actually putting their trust in themselves. And then we can do all kinds of things with our natural abilities. The only trouble is that the Spirit of God does not operate in the natural, but in the supernatural. Amen? And 
just because we are able to do things, it doesn't mean that that is what God is wanting us to do. So we have this glorious good news of the gospel. That Jesus came to make people new, to give them a new life. That all the sin and failure of the past can be forgiven, and a person can start their life all over again with a brand new heart and a new nature, Christ in them. You see, what you must understand about the gospel is the gospel is not an attempt by God to improve people. I think I probably told you the time I went to a prison and there were 400 prisoners. These were, in one of the worst prisons, these were the, the real, you know, the murderers, the rapists and all that kind of thing, violent people. I, I was told you, you can only speak for sort of four or five minutes uh, because they're only there because it's one hour out of their cells on Sunday and it's the only hour out of their cells on a Sunday. So I said, you know, Lord, what, what do I do? And he gave me the word for them. And so I said, you probably think that I've come here or that, no, I, I think you probably think that God wants to reform you. Well, he doesn't want to reform you. He wants you dead. I had their attention for the next 20 minutes and nobody murmured, nobody spoke, everybody was absolutely motionless. That morning, 49 people were born again and they were really born again because everyone, you're not allowed to minister to them and they're not allowed to come out of their places, but the, the, the uh, prison staff take the number of all those who have responded to the gospel and they're all visited in their cells within 24 hours and, and ensured that they are born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a real move of God going on in that prison at that time. Wonderful uh, chaplain there. So, <clears throat> but you see, this is it. God does not want to reform us. He wants us dead and made new. Amen? This... Look here, this does not need reforming. It's perfect. It's Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. What needs revival, reformation, is the heart. Because although God gave us a new heart, we don't always have that new heart set upon the new upon Christ, but often it drifts onto self and what self wants and what self desires. Make sense? So out there, there are a lot of people with total misconception or if they know anything about the Christian life, of what the, there are a lot of people go to church every Sunday with not understanding this. You know, they, they're there in church, oh Lord, help me, help me get through another week, help me in this, help me in that. <clears throat> and there's not necessarily the revelation of what it is to live the new life. Now, if we just finish by getting back to the scripture we started with. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Why? Because we are obeying his commands. Our hearts are set upon obeying him. If you love me, you will obey my commands because we obey his commands and do what pleases him, not what pleases self. So then our hearts do not condemn us. And when we come before God, we have confidence and we expect to receive from him whatever we ask. If we're not receiving whatever we ask, 
Where's the problem? In the heart. And this is why I told you yesterday that there are three, always, three things at the heart of any problem in people's lives. And that what is needed is repentance, change of mind, change of heart, change of heart-mind, Faith, because your focus is put on the truth and not on the things that are a denial of the truth. And forgiveness of others. I told you about the one healed of multiple sclerosis through simply forgiving someone. And Jesus said, whenever you stand praying, you must forgive others. Why? Because if you don't, you're not praying with a good heart. Not praying with the right heart. And if you don't pray with the right heart, and God's looking upon the heart, what's going to be the result of the prayer? Uh Uh-huh. So always, the answer in any situation, doesn't matter what the situation is, It will require either repentance or faith or forgiveness or any two of the three or all three. So when we get stuck, instead of blaming everybody else or instead of being introspective and looking at ourselves, which never helps, looking in, We look to the Lord and we say, Lord, you know my heart better than I do. You can see my heart and understand my heart. Show me what you can see that needs to be dealt with. Because either I need repentance change of heart focus or I need faith because I'm lacking that trust in my heart because Jesus says when you pray and when you speak to mountain and command it to move you must believe in your heart and he will convict if there's need to forgive others because you're holding on to offense and you see the answer to any prayer is a work of God's mercy and grace So if we're not being merciful and gracious, we're not going to get good results. So, beloved ones, in going out in the name of the Lord, this is who's going out. Amen. And what we're going to do now is to pray, Lord, purify my heart, cleanse my heart, do whatever is necessary in my heart so I go out there with confidence. Hallelujah. That I know that I can communicate the truth. Whatever conversations, whatever people you give me to talk to. You see, and your job is not to do the work of the Holy Spirit. Your job is never to tell people that they're sinners. No, no, no. Let the Holy Spirit convict of sin. Your job is to say things like, do you ever feel guilty about anything? Or if you could live your life over again, are there any things that you've done that you wish you hadn't done? And therefore you would not do them if you could start again. You see, because you say to people, repent of your sin, they don't even understand what you're talking about. 
because a lot of people think if they haven't murdered or committed adultery, they haven't sinned. They don't necessarily associate that with guilt and with regret. Do you feel guilty? Do you regret? Well, there's someone who can take away the guilt. And instead of living with regret, you can have an entirely new start to your life. What a God. Come on, let's stand. Come into the middle. Just look at the board one more time. Because you see what Jesus says, if you read John 3, 17, 18, here, there is condemnation. So if our hearts do not condemn us, but if our hearts are condemning us, it's because somehow this is influencing the heart. Here, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Here, there is freedom. Here, there is eternal life, not condemnation. So let's thank the Lord for our salvation, for his saving grace. Hallelujah. 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 Thank him that he's given you a new heart. When you were born again, he took out the heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh, a heart that can pulsate with the love of God. Thank him that you have that new heart. Thank him he's poured the love of the Holy Spirit into that new heart. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Pupara sandaria leto bakalazandama. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Why don't you tell the Lord you want to set your heart on things above? Make that decision. Lord, I'm setting my heart on things above, not on earthly things. I'm setting my mind on things above, not on earthly things. I want to please you, not please self. I'm not living to please myself. I'm living to please you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's really affirm this. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Now, why don't you thank him for his forgiveness for all the impurity of heart? Impurity of heart is not just having impure thoughts. Impurity of heart is anything that is set upon pleasing self rather than God. So why don't you pray right now, Lord, cleanse my heart, purify my heart. Purify my heart afresh. I don't want any pride. I don't want selfish ambition. I don't want Anything that opposes your will, I humble myself under your mighty hand this morning. I humble myself afresh. Hallelujah. I submit myself, Lord, to your will, to your word, to your purpose for my life today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what my past performance, nothing has affected my position. Thank you that I'm in Christ today. Thank you that Christ is in me today. Thank you that your spirit is in me today. Thank you that your spirit will speak through me, will work through me today. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for me. 
Hallelujah, that every day your mercy is new in my life. Thank you, Lord, for all my imperfections. The perfection of Christ in me will do good things through me, will bear good fruit for the glory of your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that this week we go out with repentance, with minds that are set upon pleasing you. Hallelujah. We've turned away from our own desires. We want to please you. Thank you, Lord, we go out in faith. Our trust and confidence is in you. It's not in ourselves. It's not in our own abilities. But, Lord, our trust is in Christ in us to speak through us, to work through us, to glorify the Father through the fruit that he bears. Thank you, Lord, that good trees bear good fruit. And thank you, Lord, that you've made us good trees. Hallelujah. That you cleanse out all the impurities. Praise your holy name. Bless your holy name. Praise you, praise you, praise you, Jesus. Pupara sandaria, leto bakala sandarama. O papara sadabaria, leto bakala sandama. I just thank the Lord for all he's been working in your heart. Not just this morning, but in these last weeks. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That you've got this purpose. Your agenda is to keep working on my heart so that my heart is set upon you, set upon pleasing you, set upon walking according to your will, set upon your word, set upon following the life of your spirit, the leadership of your spirit in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That you are bringing about that transformation in my heart that enables me to live more fully the new life that you have given me in Christ. And I praise you, and I bless you, and I exalt you, and I glorify your name. Come on, let's hear the praise of God now. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Now, Lord, we pray for opportunities to see people set free from guilt. Set free from guilt, set free from fear. Thank you, there's no fear in that new life. That it's a life of perfect love. Praise God, that perfect love casts out all fear. Thank you, we're going to see people set free from guilt, set free from shame, set free from regret and condemnation. We're going to see people set free from the things that have hindered their lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.